Hi, welcome to the Microjig Shop, and congratulations on your recent investment in the Gripper. My name is Morgan, and today we're going to be going over just about everything you could possibly need to know about the Gripper, the first of which is unboxing and assembly. So let's go ahead and get started. First thing we want to do when we open this box is make sure that everything is there. First thing is your user manual. Next is your warranty registration card. The actual main body of the Gripper, a center leg. We have a quarter inch leg a half inch leg, bag of hardware, your handle, and your balance support. Now that's for the GR100. The GR200 is everything that comes in the GR100 box with two additional accessories. The stabilizing plate, the adjustable spacer, and their hardware. Let's start assembly by attaching the handle to the main body. And to do that, you need the two quarter 20 screws, the two large oval nuts and two large washers that came in your hardware bag. Put the washer onto the screw first and then put the screw into the holes at the top of the handle. And then with the bulge side facing the handle, we screw on our large oval nuts. Again, washer onto the screw first, then screw into the hole on the handle, and then bulge side facing the handle, you thread on the large oval nut. Now it's ready to go onto the main body. The screws and nuts are in your handle. We're ready to put it onto the main body. So you just slide the oval nuts into the T-slots on top of the main body. Just center the handle and tighten the screws. Those T-slots are going to keep that oval nut in place. All right, first step down. Let's keep moving. Once the handle's on, we're going to put the center leg on. You're going to use these small dovetail nuts. You insert it at the holes at each end of the center leg from the inside facing out. Then just insert those dovetail nuts into the T-slots on the ends of the main body. Now you see there's a screw sticking out on each end. So you just take your smaller washers, put that on the screw first, and then these green female knobs. All right, center leg is on. We're almost there. Each leg attaches with two screws, two washers, and two O-rings. And I'm gonna show you what those O-rings are for in a minute. So you simply slide the washer onto the screw and then the screw into the inset hole on the outside of the leg. Now we'll hold it there while we slide the O-ring onto the screw on the other side of the leg. Once you put these O-rings on, you'll likely never see them again, but the reason they're there is so that when you remove the legs, you don't want to lose any of this hardware. The screw or the washer are very small, they're easy to get lost. And the O-ring keeps it in place, so even if you remove the leg, O-ring's gonna keep that there so you never have to worry about losing it. Now just align the screws with the brass inserts on the main body and screw it in. Half inch leg's on, let's do the quarter inch leg. The quarter inch leg goes on exactly the same way. Bounce support is really easy to put on. It just goes on with two of these green knobs, two washers, and again, two O-rings. So just put the washer over the knob and then insert the knob into the slot on the outside of the balance support and then roll that O-ring on to the inside and you'll see there's a little recessed channel here for that O-ring to sit in. And again, it can attach to either the quarter inch leg or the half inch leg. Both sides have brass inserts for the balance support knobs to go into. All right, see, that wasn't so bad. Gripper's assembled, now we can move on to the fun stuff. Okay, if you're still with us, that means that you have the GR200 and you've got some more accessories to learn about. The stabilizing plate and the adjustable spacer. So let's go ahead and dive right in with the adjustable spacer. Locate your blue hardware bag that came in your GR200 box. You'll notice that the adjustable spacer requires the exact same hardware that the balance support does, and it attaches to the gripper the exact same way. So you already know how to do this. But to refresh your memory, it requires two of these knobs, two black O-rings, and two steel washers. And just like we did with the balance support, the washer goes over the knob, and then you insert the knob into the outside of the adjustable spacer. And again, just like the balance support, you slide an O-ring on to the other side and it sits inside of this recessed channel here. There we go. O-rings are doing their job. They're not going anywhere. See, the adjustable spacer attaches to the opposite side that the balance support is on. And it goes in the exact same brass inserts that the balance support would go into. All right, the adjustable spacer is going to give you an additional inch of ripping capacity on your gripper. Okay, let's go ahead and get our stabilizing plate ready for use. 
You'll notice that there's two sides. One side has a recessed channel and the other side is flush. The T-bolts are going to go into the recessed side and that's the bottom. You see that the stabilizing plate is flush on the table and those bolts aren't dragging on it. Now you take your red O-rings that came in your blue hardware bag and you slide that down over the T-nut down to the base of the T-nut. Next we take our shoulder washers and we slide those down with the flat side facing up. Now we just take our wing knobs and we screw those on to the T-bolts. Now the stabilizing plate attaches to the balance support by sliding the shoulder washer into these notches here. Well done. Now your grippers assembled and ready for use. We refer to the gripper as a 3D push block and we call it that because unlike any other push block in the world, the gripper gives you three directions of control. The green grip on the bottom here grabs the wood and it allows you to maintain constant pressure downward onto the table, inward toward the fence, and forward through the cut. What's unique about the gripper is that it's designed to control both the keeper and the offcut side of your workpiece. And the reason that's important is because you never ever want a loose piece of wood just rattling around that spinning blade. I'm sure that most of you, like all of us, have used push sticks in the past. I'm going to show you what's wrong with push sticks right now. The friction on the bottom of your workpiece wants to bring that wood away from the fence, no matter what you do. Every time you push it, it's going to want to pull away from the fence, every time. So when your workpiece passes those front teeth, as it moves along the body, there's a little bit of room, not much, but just enough. There's a little bit of room for your workpiece to move. The gripper keeps it tight against the fence. Without the gripper, that piece may want to stray away from the fence and make contact with the back teeth as they're coming out of the back of the saw. When that happens, you run the risk of one of those back teeth grabbing the workpiece and shooting it back out at you. That's the root cause of kickback, and that's what the gripper prevents. What the gripper does to eliminate that problem is that it keeps constant pressure to the fence and downward on the table, and that controls both sides of your cut, keeping it from pinching the back of the blade. That's not only important for preventing kickback, but it also gives you a much cleaner cut. We call the gripper a moving blade guard because it allows you to control your piece from the top throughout the entire cut. It creates separation between your hands and the blade, so even if you were to have an accident, your gripper paid the price and not your hands. If or when you cut into one of the legs on your gripper, don't worry about it, it's not a big deal. All of these legs are individually replaceable and they're a lot cheaper than a visit to the emergency room. Now that we've covered some of the key benefits and safety features, we're ready to go ahead and make our first cut. Since the quarter inch leg is up against the fence, I'm going to set the fence to a quarter inch so I can show you a quarter inch cut. When making cuts with the gripper, there is some technique involved, but it's simple and very important. A good way to achieve these cuts is by putting your stock against the fence and then setting your gripper on top of the stock, just separate it a little bit and then sliding it toward the fence. As you push your workpiece through the cut, you're applying a little pressure downward, but also toward the fence and that's going to make sure that your workpiece is staying parallel to the blade at all times. Quick tip, once you set your center leg in your fence, it's a good policy to pass the gripper over the blade just to make sure that it's clear. And as always, safety first, wear eye protection. Now you'll notice that I had complete control of both sides of my workpiece throughout the entire cut. Matter of fact, I was able to pull it back toward me with both sides of it in the exact same position relative to one another. The only thing that's missing is the curve that the blade took out. You'll also notice that there's no burning or blade marks because the gripper kept the piece parallel to the blade the entire time. Now that we've ripped this quarter inch piece, we can actually rip it down again to one quarter inch by one quarter inch. And here's where your balance support and your center leg come in. Put that piece against your fence and then set the gripper on top and against the fence. Now you'll notice that we're wobbling. We don't want to wobble. That's why every gripper, GR100 and GR200, comes with this balance support. The gripper on top and push it to where the outside leg is tight against the fence. Then you loosen these knobs and drop your balance support. And it's that easy. Now we have no side to side wobble. And now here's where your center leg comes into play. Even though this is a small piece, you can still control both sides of the cut by adjusting the center leg. You slide the center leg over so that it's covering as much of the off cut side of your work piece as it can without making contact with the outside of the blade. That looks like a good spot. And again, we're going to run the gripper without the work piece under it just to make sure that we have clearance for our blade. Oh yeah, it's good stuff. Now the blade is going to pass right between the center leg and the quarter inch leg that's up against the fence. And we're still going to be able to control both sides of that work piece. <laughs> now 
Now we ended up with an offcut side that is slightly larger than a quarter of an inch, so we can rip that one down too. Waste not, want not. Check that out. A clean quarter inch by quarter inch cut, safely and easily. Try doing that with a push stick. Again, the center leg of the gripper is adjustable, so if I want to make a small cut, like a quarter inch, I can have the center leg controlling the offcut side. If my cut's wider, say two inches, I can have the center leg positioned on the fence side of the blade, and the half inch leg is going to control the offcut side. Now, if you remove the balance support completely and just use the gripper body by itself, you can use the half inch leg up against the fence and the quarter inch leg to control the offcut side. And this will give you a rip capacity of about three inches. You see, I was able to keep control of both sides of the cut still, and this small offcut side is still being completely controlled by the gripper. If you need to make a cut wider than three inches, you put the balance support back onto the gripper onto the side with the half inch leg. Using the gripper with the balance support riding against the fence, you'll get a rip capacity of about five inches. Well, that just about covers the basics. Stay tuned as we dive in a little deeper and explore the versatility of the gripper with various accessories, different configurations, and advanced techniques. Thanks for watching. Up to this point, we've seen what the gripper can do right out of the box, but now let's have a look at some of the accessories we make that you can use with your gripper to give you more control, safety, and functionality. There are four main accessories we make for the gripper. One of them is the handle bridge kit. Next is the gravity heel kit. Then there's the deflector connector. And last but certainly not least, this is our most popular accessory, is the eighth inch leg. And since we're already at the table saw, let's go ahead and have a look at the eighth inch leg. The eighth inch leg attaches right to your gripper and it's used to, you guessed it, make eighth inch cuts. You can attach it either to the main body by removing one leg or you can just put it onto the side of either the quarter inch leg or the half inch leg. It's a matter of preference. It also includes the hardware so that you don't have to use the same hardware for one of your other legs so you can attach it right onto the side of one of the legs. Just like the quarter inch leg and the half inch leg, the eighth inch leg attaches the gripper using two screws, two washers, and two o-rings. And you can attach the gripper one of two ways. You can either remove a leg and attach it to the main body. If you remove a leg and attach it to the main body, you're going to use these two screws right here, the top ones. If you choose to attach this onto the outside of one of the legs, use these two screws right here, the lower ones that are a little bit further apart. And just like we covered in the assembly portion, washer goes over the screw, screw goes into the hole, and the o-ring slides over the screw on the inside of the leg. See that? It's going nowhere. It's genius. So I'm going to attach it to the side of the quarter inch leg. It's that easy. The eighth inch leg is now installed, ready to make eighth inch rips. All right, the fence is set to one eighth of an inch. Bear in mind, this is an eighth of an inch leg. So if you cut into this leg, it's not going to kill you, but there's not really going to be much left on that leg to work with. So again, move your material and run the gripper over the blade just to make sure that it's clear. I think we're good. So let's make that cut. And here we have a smooth, clean, one eighth inch rip. Let's go ahead and rip it down again to one eighth by one eighth, just for fun. Check it out, eighth inch by eighth inch. And the likelihood that you're going to need parts this small is not that high, unless you're making your own matches or toothpicks or something. But if you're making your own edge banding or any other kind of decorative inlay, the eighth inch leg is exactly what you need. Earlier on in the assembly portion of this video, I instructed you to install the handle onto the dead center of the gripper's main body. And the reason for that is because as you're applying downward pressure, you want all of that pressure to be evenly distributed across all three legs. And the only way to do that is to have it centered. The handle bridge kit, however, allows you to reposition your handle and still apply pressure evenly on all three legs. Every handle bridge kit includes two handle bridges, a trailing hook, and I'll get to that in a minute, and their hardware. Installation is incredibly simple. Just remove the stock handle, just like before the washer goes onto the screw, and then the screw goes in to the hole through the top of the handle. Then you take your handle bridge, Screw goes into the center slot here on the handle bridge, and then the square nut goes onto the screw in this recessed channel here. 
In your hardware bag, locate the four 1032 screws and the corresponding washers and oval nuts. The screw goes into the top of the handle bridge and then the oval nut goes on to it on the other side. When you put it onto the main body, make sure that the brass inserts here are facing the outside of the gripper. And just make sure that the bridges are centered on the gripper body. Okay, the bridges are tightened down. Now you see that your handle has a nice range of motion. And you can set that handle at whatever angle feels comfortable for you. Also included with the handle bridge kit is this trailing hook and its mounting hardware. You can attach the trailing hook into the same T-slot that the center leg sits in. Using the T-bolt, you attach the trailing hook and then slide your washer over and then of course the wing nut. You'll notice that the trailing hook sits a little bit lower than the legs and that's because it acts as a heel to help push your material through. Whether you're using a router bit that takes out a lot of material, the trailing hook just helps move the material along through the cut. Also on the handle bridge, you'll notice these four brass inserts. And that brings us to our next accessory, the deflector connector. The deflector connector includes the deflector connector plate and the hardware, which is four yellow quarter 20 knobs, four shoulder washers, and four O-rings. Let's go ahead and start by installing it on one gripper. Slide your shoulder washer over the screw portion of the knob and then roll your black O-ring on over that. In addition to being a chip deflector, it can also connect two grippers together. And for that, you'll need the other two knobs. This becomes especially useful when you're working with larger stock. It gives you a lot more control by covering a broader surface. If you're working with longer stock and you don't want to do the hand over hand motion, you can connect two grippers together long ways and make one giant gripper out of it. Pretty awesome. The last accessory we'll be covering today is the gravity heel kit. In the gravity heel kit package, you'll find five gravity heels, two heel spacers, two T-bolts and two washers, two springs and two shoulder washers, and two yellow wing knobs. You take your heel spacer and slide it over the T-bolt with the female notch and the male extrusion facing out. Then the spring goes over that, then your gravity heel. And you're going to want to make sure that your female notch and your male extrusion are aligned with one another. After that, put on your shoulder washer and finally your wing knob. In this situation, it would be used as a static heel. I tighten this knob down and it's going to support the workpiece from the back. And that's ideal for smaller workpieces. So now if I loosen the knob slightly, it becomes dynamic. So if I'm cutting a longer piece of stock on the table saw or I'm using this on the joiner, using the hand over hand method, I can reposition my gripper as many times as I need to for longer stock and it's just going to retract up and stay out of my way until I reach the end of the workpiece, in which case it will drop all the way down and support it from the back to push it all the way through the cut. There's a couple things that are unique about the gravity heel. One is that it's dynamic and it'll retract when used on top of a workpiece. The second is that it's made to be cut. Say you're using it on the router table and you're using a bit that takes out a lot of material. Well, the gravity heel will support it from the back to make sure that even though it's difficult to get through that cut, it'll push it all the way through. But also because it's made to be cut, it'll completely protect the end of the workpiece from tearing out. The profile that you're routing on your workpiece will just get routed out of the gravity heel. Because these are designed to be sacrificial, we offer two packages. One is the gravity heel kit, which includes all the hardware and everything you need to install them. But once you go through all the gravity heels that are in that kit, you can buy the package that just has the gravity heel replacements. And it's very affordable because we know that you're going to go through these and that's what they're designed to do. One situation where the gravity heel comes in awfully handy is when you're cutting a piece where the offcut side isn't very big and there's not enough material there for the green grip on the center leg to grab a hold of it. Even though the center leg isn't touching the offcut side, the gravity heel is supporting it from the back and it's going to push it all the way through the cut to keep it from running back out at you. Well that concludes the accessories portion of the video series. See all these accessories in action on different tools in the shop in their respective chapters. Thanks for watching. Over the course of this video series, we're going to be talking about lots of different applications for the gripper using all sorts of different tools in your shop, but this chapter is specifically for using the gripper on the table saw. The first thing we want to consider when using the gripper on the table saw is the length of material that we can cut using just one gripper. In order for the gripper to work, it needs to be on top of your workpiece on top of the table. 
For instance, this piece of cherry, it's right in front of the blade as though I was about to start making a cut. This is about as far back onto the table as I can put my gripper without it tilting back on me. I don't want it tilting back on me. It needs to be on the table. Let's imagine my stock was longer. I'm going through the cut and I get to this point. Here, I would have to hold it down, move my gripper, and adjust my grip to continue my cut. You never want to do that. That's very dangerous. The first reason is you're going to see blade marks every time you stop. Burning and blade marks are a warning that your piece is making too much contact with the back teeth of the blade, and that means kickback, and that means no fun. That being said, for stock 18 inches or longer, we recommend, you guessed it, two grippers. By using two grippers, you're able to control it at the front of the cut and all the way at the back. Now, once you reach this point, if your stock's longer than this, you can reposition the gripper that you have in the front to behind this one here, and continue making that cut using this leapfrog method. And that works for stock this length, and theoretically it would work for stock a mile long if you have the outfit support to do it. Technically, you could cut longer stock using just one gripper, but we don't recommend it, and here's why. If you're starting the cut with just your hand, once you get close to the blade, you have to stop, reposition your grip, start again, stop, reposition, and start again. And then once you reach the end, you finish it off with the gripper. Not only is that dangerous, but it's going to take you extra time to sand out those saw marks so that you can continue working with that piece. It's annoying, and it's a needless waste of time nobody has. If you're the skeptical type, I don't blame you. So that's why I'm going to show you right now what happens when you try to cut long stock with just one gripper. If you look closely, you can see a blade mark everywhere that I stopped to adjust my grip. There's either a burn or a blade mark or both. You can see right away the difference in cut quality. And that's because I didn't have to stop and readjust my grip. I was able to feed the material through the cut without stopping using two grippers almost as though I had a power feeder. Now we already know that the gripper is awesome for making vertical cuts, but what about bevel cuts? Thought you'd never ask. So you can tilt the blade to 45 degrees and make miter cuts using your gripper. One thing to bear in mind is that because your blade is tilted, the higher you set your blade, the more it's moving to the side and that's cutting into your rib capacity. Another thing to keep in mind is where you position the center leg on a bevel cut. You wanna make sure that it's never above the blade because as you're putting pressure down, because the blade is tilted, you're putting pressure down onto the blade. If you're putting pressure onto the blade directly, you're not going to get a good cut. The gripper is also great for cutting veneers. Veneers are usually very difficult to cut on a table saw for a couple reasons. One is the space underneath the fence. You can't really run it along the fence because it just slides underneath. Two, sometimes when it's a longer cut, the veneer has a tendency to ride up over the blade. It doesn't want to actually stay down on the table. So to cut this piece of veneer, I'm going to use my balance support up against the fence, and I'm going to use the gripper out here over the veneer to keep everything down on the table right near the blade. All right, safety glasses, let's let it rip. That was the easiest thing I've ever done. Right out of the box, both the GR100 and the GR200 are capable of ripping material down to as small as one quarter inch by one quarter inch using the quarter inch leg against the fence. I'm going to show you how to do that right now. Now we're using the quarter inch leg up against the fence, so we're going to use the center leg to control the off cut side. Again, you always want to make sure that your balance support is set right so that your gripper is putting even pressure directly down onto the table. <laughs> So that's one. We can actually rip this down a couple more times to one quarter inch by one quarter inch. And again, now you're going to need to adjust your balance support. All right, now we're balanced. And we're going to move our center leg in just a little bit more to make sure that we're controlling that off cut side. And lastly, remember it's always a good idea to run the gripper without the material in there just to make sure that your legs aren't going to hit that blade or the other way around.
And just like that, we have quarter inch by quarter inch cuts ripped down by the gripper safely and easily. Try to do that with a push stick. Although the gripper was designed primarily for use on the table saw, the way it was designed makes it versatile so that you can use it on just about any tool in your shop. If it requires control and safety, odds are the gripper can help. So now let's have a look at some of the ways you can use your gripper on the bandsaw. One of my personal favorite ways to use the gripper is resawing material on the bandsaw. Material that's bigger than just a few inches can't be resawn on a table saw. It needs more capacity, and the only thing that you can do that on is a bandsaw. So the larger the stock that you have to resaw, the more surface area there is that you need to control. Odds are if you're cutting rough lumber, it's not going to be square, so it's not going to sit totally flush on the fence or on the table. But because your gripper is square, you can press it tight to the fence and press the gripper down on the table surface so that you know that it's staying parallel to the blade the whole time. And of course the best and most important feature is that it's keeping your hand way out here, nowhere near that blade. When I resawed this piece, I was running it along the fence, but not every bandsaw has a fence. So if you don't have a fence, you can do that same thing with two grippers. Check this out. Pretty neat, huh? Another great way to use your gripper on the bandsaw is for cutting veneers. The process is the same as it was for resawing the material like I just showed you, but a piece this wide presents a good opportunity if you have the GR200 or the upgrade kit, it presents a great opportunity to use your stabilizing plate and adjustable spacer. And the way the adjustable spacer is designed, it's pretty awesome. The green grip is just inset just ever so slightly so that you can run it vertically and not worry about that green grip sticking to your table surface because that's exactly what it's supposed to do. This way, not this way. And you can also add the stabilizing plate to the balance support. When you add that to the balance support, you got to make sure that you drop the rest of the gripper down because it elevates it just so slightly. What the stabilizing plate is going to do for us here is it's going to provide some extra support up here at the top of the material. A lot of times when resawing people will use feather boards all that's doing is just pushing the bottom of the material into the bottom of the fence. It's not securing this up here at all. To secure this up here with a feather board, you have to use your hands. And then once you start getting toward the end, you're getting pretty close to that blade. And then you have to reach around and pull it from this side. I don't like the way that looks, and I don't think you should do it. All right, we're just about set up to cut our veneers. But there's one more accessory that I'd like to add. This is a 12-inch wide piece of oak. This is a powerful bandsaw but oak is notoriously hard and it may be difficult for just the green grip to push this through that cut. So I'm going to add a gravity heel. The reason I put that on is because I know that while I'm cutting this veneer, I'm going to want most of my pressure to be up front. But as I move toward the back, I'm going to have to reposition my gripper until I get to the end here. Once I reach the end, it'll be able to grab the back of that material and support it through the cut and finish it off. All right, there's a few great ways for you to use your gripper on the bandsaw. There's more tools, more applications, and more to learn in the other chapters. So tune back in, and thanks for watching. We've seen the grippers put to good use on the table saw, the router table, the bandsaw. Now let's check out the joiner. Because of this green grip material, the gripper is an excellent companion when you're using your joiner. Whether you're face joining or your edge joining, you can turn it both ways, and it's going to help you, and it's going to keep you safe each time. Here I'm using two grippers and I've got them each set up a little differently so you can see the advantages of each configuration. First off, I have gravity heels on both of them. The reason I did that is because this is a long piece of stock and I'm going to use the hand over hand method to feed it all the way through the cutter head. And once it reaches the end, then that heel is going to engage and push it through the end of the cut. This one I used an adjustable spacer just because it adds an inch of extra gripping material and when you're face joining that's a good thing to have.
As you know, it's important to have one flat, smooth edge when you're joining material so that it comes off 90 degrees. That's just another awesome way the gripper can help you out in your shop. I was able to flatten this material on the joiner without my hands anywhere near this powerful cutter head. The same way it does on a table saw, the green grip, the adjustable legs, and the balance support give you incredible control over your material on a router table. Let's start with one of the more simple processes. We're just going to route a basic dovetail groove into this piece of MDF. Coincidentally, this is the same dovetail profile and router bit depth that we use for our match fit system. So check that out later. You'll notice when I routed this part, the balance support wasn't engaged. So I'm going to route another one with the balance support engaged so you can see how it works on a router table. Just like that. Let's say I wanted to make some cabinet doors and I wanted to use rail and style joinery. So in order to do that, I have to use a rail and style bit. And these bits tend to take out a lot of material, which can give you some resistance. So the gripper is going to help us get that piece all the way through the cut and combat that resistance. But also on this cut, I'm going to be using a gravity heel. Like I said, it removes a lot of material. So when you reach the end of your piece, you don't want it tearing out. So the gravity heel is going to get it through the cut, but it's also going to protect the end from tearing out. All right, you see what happened there? It routed that profile out of my gravity heel, which is good because that's exactly what it's designed for. It pushed it all the way through the cut and it prevented the end from tearing out. That's a nice clean end that I can work with without having to chop it off or sand anything. If you don't have the gravity heels or you don't want to tear yours up, you can still prevent tear out on the ends of your work pieces by turning your gripper into a coping sled. Turning your gripper into a coping sled is incredibly easy if you have the stabilizing plate that comes with the GR200. All you have to do is attach your stabilizing plate to a scrap piece of MDF. We recommend 8x12 and you do that with just four screws and these notches on the ends here. And This will not damage your stabilizing plate. Once you have that secured, you just attach your stabilizing plate to the balance support like you always would and run it all the way back to the end and tighten it down. And the stabilizing plate, you'll notice it adds a little bit of elevation to the bottom of the gripper and that just gives you a little bit of clearance when you're routing that profile. So now instead of the edge of the gripper riding along the fence, we're going to be using the edge of the MDF. Coping sled works. Two clean edges, no tear out. Beautiful. Sometimes you need to route a profile where the bit sits above the material. In those situations, you need to use the adjustable spacer. I'm using this Roman OG bit, and the bit sits well above my material, which is fine if I have the adjustable spacer. Now we have clearance for our bit, but we're also able to use the adjustable spacer to ride on the fence. And then we have the quarter inch leg and the center leg gripping that material. One of the main advantages of the gripper is that it always has a flat edge to ride against the fence. But if you're using a router without the fence, the gripper is still extraordinarily helpful. Let's say I want to duplicate this circle I made. The circle is my template, and I want to get it onto this MDF. I went ahead and roughed it out on the bandsaw a little bit earlier, and I double-sided taped it so that it would stick together. Now I'm going to use the gripper to keep the material together and flat down on the surface so that I can template this circle onto the MDF. You see, the gripper allowed me to keep my material together and firmly down on the table. Also, I was able to pull it back and adjust my grip every couple inches and keep routing without any problem. If you wanted to route a groove into the edge of a board and you're working with a piece that's taller than it is wide, that's a good opportunity to use the stabilizing plate. I cut some parts for a project I'm making and I want to give them a slight round over on all sides. 
These parts are a little bit long, so just like on the table saw, we're gonna use two grippers to continually feed it through. Gorgeous. Those are just some of the ways that the gripper can give you better control and more safety on your router table. Thanks for watching. We're going to wrap up this instructional series by going over just a few care and maintenance tips for your new gripper. The gripper is a very low maintenance piece of equipment. There's just a few things to keep in mind moving forward that's going to get the most life out of your gripper. As a general rule, you just don't want to allow a bunch of sawdust to build up in your shop. Not on your saw, not on your wood. Whether it's wax or oil or sawdust, things can build up on your tools and they can build up on your green grip. So it's a good practice to once a month wipe it down with 91% isopropyl alcohol. It's good stuff. It's very easy to find in any old pharmacy or grocery store. It's all over the place. Just give it a couple sprays. And wipe it down with a clean cloth or paper towel. Good as new. You'll be amazed at how you can restore your traction with just a little bit of rubbing alcohol. If you're using your gripper correctly, the green grip should never wear down because it moves with the part. There's never friction. It always just stays on top in one place. You can, however, cut into these legs. And I say can, what I meant was will. And when you do, that's okay because all of these legs are individually replaceable in our online store. But these legs can take a few cuts before they need to be replaced. So as long as you don't feel like it's affecting its gripping power, you should be fine. You'll notice that the center leg, if you move both sides at the same time, it moves very smoothly. If you try to move one side at a time, it tries to bind up. But if you ever feel like it's getting sticky, a little bit of paste wax in this T-slot will make this thing run like butter. One last thing to keep an eye on is your O-rings. These O-rings are rubber, and like any rubber, over time it can get dried out, it can crack, and it can break. And these O-rings are important because as you're moving parts around, reconfiguring your gripper, you don't want to lose these knobs. That's why the O-rings are important. So if your O-rings break or get lost, those are replaceable and again available in our online store. Under normal conditions, your gripper should last a very, very long time. So just take good care of it like you would anything else in your shop. Don't leave it out in the sun with a green grip facing directly up. Don't take it scuba diving or don't bring it into outer space. Other than that, you should be in good shape. Enjoy.